I did inside. Um, and it was probably the most valuable thing that I could have ever done at that point. I things had just come to a head, you know, there was suicidal ideations, the whole nine yards, especially when it came close to getting out. Um, it was crazy, man. It, it was just rough because I didn't think I could do anything else either. Right. I had put so much time and energy into this. I took some of that energy out too, like negatively towards my wife. I blame her. Like oh, you're making me get out and I got all these dreams and goals. <laughs> That's bullshit. Uh, but in reality, she was saving my life because she could see it. She's outside. And, and I think, you know, we got to give credit to our spouses and our people that are with us that see us day to day. They know us, especially if they knew us prior to the military. And like I said, she's a whip, man. She's super on it, educated, highly educated nurse, you know, bachelor's in nursing. And so she's really big on the psychology piece too. And so she was able to see other things too that I was dealing with. And was like, whoa, we need to address this. And she stood by my side through the worst of the worst times, especially with that transition piece because I got out and I was just lost. Welcome to the Transition Drill Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Pantiani. I appreciate you taking the time to watch. So let's get into this. Go ahead and throw that mic on. So we, I mean, are we jiving? Yeah, you're you're giving you're giving gems that aren't coming across the microphone. Damn it! I'm sorry, man. Um, it's it's not that I have a problem sleeping. Yeah, it's just I wake up. I'm that guy that I could go out. We can go out drinking, go out partying. I'll get in bed at two o'clock, dead tired, sleep. 6.30, 6.30, 7 o'clock. All right, let's go. High energy, ready to get after it, though. You got, yeah. You got a purpose, though, in life. Look at this, man. You got this incredible podcast. But, you got but things that, you're doing. That, it's been that way. It, I've never been one of those guys who could sleep in until, like, noon. These yeah. people, I, I would love to do that just once. You know what, man? I, I kind of played around with I mean, I'm lot. not a jocko where it's like I can get up on the <laughs> on the go at 4.30, but I aim for that every yeah. morning. Yeah. You know? And that's a, hey, that's a good way to live life, right? If you want to have a, okay, let's talk about just your circadian rhythm and how we're built, right? We're designed to be optimal when the sun is out. We got all this blue light coming in. It's raising our serotonin levels. We're feeling nice and energized. Like, you should absolutely capitalize on that as best you can, right? And then, you know what, man? As the day starts to wind down, right, you should you should have all that work front-loaded. That's going to help your cortisol levels start to come down. It's going to help your melatonin levels start to come up. And then you'll start to just sleep more efficiently. So the better that you can get on a normal circadian rhythm, be up when the sun's out, that's when your body's ready to God, take in nutrients and break them down to help you repair and recover towards the end of the day the better you can have a tighter circadian rhythm the better you're going to be man overall right and obviously some of us have work you know responsibilities family responsibilities you got to deal with all that but again if you can get some good activity in get your heart rate up get moving early in the day it sets you up for the rest of the day with success man just your metabolism is going to be optimized your mind will be much better you eliminate that brain fog Now, listen, man, there's definitely times where I think it's beneficial to sleep in and kind of play around with things. If you're tired, pay attention to your body, man. And I think we go a little too hard on ourselves, too. Like, I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to freaking, you know what I mean? I got to be like Jocko, right? And that's fine. What a great person to to model yourself after, after, right? And, I mean, that's just the core of the military or or law enforcement, anything. It's be, be ready, be ready to go, right? But, man, if you need to take a break, by all means, I think we need to do that more often, too. Let our bodies recover, get real in tune, and then psh, optimize from there, right? Set your goals. If you want to get up early, you know, work at it. Make it a process and attach the good things that you're looking for, not just to the outcome. I'm going to get up at 530, but look forward to like, hey, man, I set a new goal for myself to achieve today, and that's to be optimized. I'm going to wake up a little bit earlier than I did before. I'm going to try to go to bed a little bit earlier than I did the night before. And just those little incremental changes add huge value to your performance and to your life overall. Well, you said something earlier that what I think is great is that we a, a lot of us live our lives on social media and we see those social media influencers. Yeah. And, and the thing that I think a lot of people don't take into to consideration is for many of those people, that's their job. Right. So they're going to look fantastic. Oh, yeah. On top of the fact that 
they did a photo shoot for those Instagram photos. Yep. yep. So find that point. And, and what I'm getting to is you talked about diet earlier. Mm. Just because X says, hey, I eat A, B, C, and D today doesn't mean it's going to work for you. You've got to figure out what works for you. Absolutely. And it doesn't – I'm not saying that being in the gym for two or three hours isn't a good thing, but the, it, is it three hours because you were working hard, busting your ass, or is it three hours because you were screwing off, checking Instagram between sets? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, but it's, it's finding what works for you. Sure. And then you, you talk about sleep. Yeah. We both come from professions that don't lend itself to that because – no. Military and first responders tend to do most of their work when the sun goes oh down. Oh, my God, that's right. When all the bad guys are out there sleeping, that's when we're getting after it and working, right? Right. Yep. And so I, I can see how 20 or 30 years of that could really just jack yeah. with a person's system. Yeah, and I think you see that, too. Like, when you, when you look at a lot of guys that have kind of poor outcomes when they're transitioning out of that, it's like you said, we're designed, we're, our bodies are kind of optimized when we're in that mindset of being a first responder, right? You're tuned to it. You're getting up early. Everyone around you is on the same path. So your body, your body chemistry is going to adjust to that mind state. And then when you transition out, it's like, and it's not like you get a smooth transition and you get to titrate down on that process. It's like hard and fast. You're Here's out the, the door. Next day, What if you don't have a plan set, or if you're not going into it with the mindset like, listen, i got to make some adjustments, then that's when you're going to really see some problems, man. And I think that's where guys kind of fall into that trap where they're up all day, they're up all night, they get heavy into the drinking, and, you know, it kind of creates this really negative cascade. And so you got to really look at your, you know, your process. Like, what am I going to do when I make that transition out? Absolutely, you need to stay on top of your health. That's one of the best things that you can do when you transition out is try to model all of the good things, the discipline, the structure, that little bit of rigidity into your everyday life. And I think that that's a great way to make that transition happen, man. Sign up for a gym. Hell, if you need to be in the gym for three hours because that's what you were accustomed to back in the day, let's start making some adjustments so you can model your life and carry that process through because that's what allowed you to be optimized when you were in your profession where it mattered the most. And guess what? It's going to matter a whole hell of a lot more now that you're out and you don't have that window and those people to fall back on. So carry those good things with you when you transition and try to model your life this pretty much as close as you can to how you lived it a little bit differently, obviously you're on the outside, but man, it will really make a difference when it comes to your outcomes and the transition piece and being healthy. Well, and I would say to add to that, though, is yeah. just because you're out, whether you're, you know, end your enlistment or you're retired, you still need to find your new mission. Yes. Because so many of us were driven by the mission while we were active. And so it was easy to justify, hey, I need to be in the gym for three hours because yep. I got to be good to go. Yeah. But when you cycle out, find that next mission that still gives your life that purpose. Yeah. Maybe it doesn't mean being in the gym for three hours, but you still want to be physically healthy to do whatever you're doing. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And even like, so, yep, you can't do the three-hour thing, but even finding time like throughout the day, hey, I'm going to take a 10-minute walk. You're transitioning. Like, so you're being used to being outdoors, too, in the military. A lot, of, a lot of our time is spent outdoors, man. No matter what your job is, you're transitioning, you're moving, you know, you're out, you're running across the compound. And then some guys transition and they're stuck in an office. And they're miserable and they don't do anything and they just start to waste away nope no 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 no. take a break get outside move around don't just sit there at the desk and have your lunch have your lunch go outside for a 10 minute walk it makes all the difference in the world man little little things like that you have to try to incorporate into your day just to make sure your performance stays on top and that you keep your mental health in check sedentary lifestyle is just the worst let's go backwards on you where'd you sure. grow up Wow, man, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles in Watts, between Century and Central, right across from the uh, famous Will Rogers Park. You know, we used to have uh, Serena Williams and Venus Williams play there. Tyrese Gibson used to live right around the corner from me. You know, a lot, a lot of great talent came out of that place, even though it was, man, it was a hellhole at the time. I grew up there in the 80s and the 90s. You know, crack epidemic was big, gang violence major every night gunshots helicopters i mean it was like being in freaking baghdad or something it was insane you know i lived through the rodney king riots watch my city burn to the ground watch military all in the streets and guys just running rampant and i mean that's just how it was every single day it was crazy 
Um, you know, my mom, she did the best she could, single parent, right? Dad was off doing God only knows what. Um, I had a you know, strong grandmother in my life. Um, you know, grew up with my sister as well, so it was just all women in the house. But uh, Sibling-wise, just you and your sister? Just me, my sister, my grandmother, and my mother. And, uh, you know, I'm very grateful, though, to have had those women in my life, my grandmother particularly, because she's the one that really taught me how to be strong and how to deal with adversity and not to allow my environment to control my mindset, that I'm the one that can set the conditions and that I can be anything I needed to be, anything I want to be. You're So... Am I assuming correctly you were able to avoid the gang life? Oh, my gosh, man. I tried to like the plague, right? I had to fight every day to deal with, you know. When I was younger, <clears throat> it's different, man. I grew up, you know, I had a bunch of neighborhood kids around. We had a ton of kids, and it was such a cool, diverse community, man. We had Hispanics everywhere. We had, obviously, black folks all over the place. We had an Asian family down the street. I mean, it was very cool, man. The kids were all great. We all played together. But then as we got older, that's when things start to change, right? Gang life is there. I mean, we had one of the roughest gangs in the, in the city that started on my street. I grew up on 99th Street in Watts. And so, you know, it was a big crip area. Down the street, you had the Grape Street Crips. On the other side, you've got the Jordan Down Projects. I mean, it was like middle of hell, basically, right? So, you know, I had to avoid that. I, you know, my grandmother was very instrumental in that. My mother was very instrumental in that, keeping me away from it. Always trying to take me outside of that community, too, and show me different things, right? We'd always went to the beach a lot. That's where I fell in love with swimming. You know, got to go to, you know, my mom always took me to the library, bookstores. Always tried to feed me with knowledge and just expose me to, you know, something outside of that environment. And I think that was tremendously valuable. And I think it's tremendously valuable for anybody to get out of their environment and, broaden their horizons right so yeah it was a constant struggle man every day just to avoid the trappings of street life you know did your mom grow up in the same area my mother family grew up in grew up in uh, watts originally my family migrated from the south louisiana had some family come from indiana as well migrated into california i want to say probably in the early 20s right around then started off in stockton Worked our way down through Los Angeles. You know, we have some, have some family in Venice Beach. I've got family all over the place, right, in California. But mostly, yeah, I started from the south, migrated, and came on down to Watts, you know, prior to the whole white flight that we're familiar with. And so it was kind of a nice community to start, and then it just transitioned into something else. And over the years, it got worse and worse. Like I said, the crack epidemic came in and just, man, I mean, really turned that whole community upside down. And that's unfortunate, but... Was your, was your grandmother yeah. kind of the linchpin that kind of kept your mom on the straight and narrow and then ultimately you or? You know what? I think so, man. My grandmother was an incredible person. She, she passed recently, uh, but what, man, she left such a huge impression on me and every, just everybody. She was a pillar of the community. My grandfather, he passed early on, you know, in the, in the early 70s, uh, but he was also very active in the community, right, trying to uplift people. He was, uh, he would go out and talk to the homeless folks or people that were on drugs and try to really help them, really um, develop one of the first, like, Alcoholic Anonymous programs out there to try oh, wow. to help people, you know, come off of drugs. He started something, I believe he called it the, uh, the Barefoot Breakfast Club, and so he would take his shoes off, take, uh, carry a milk crate, and go sit down next to the homeless guys or guys that were on drugs or, you know, back then there was veterans that we were still dealing with coming out of World War II and, you know, Korea War, you name it. And so he would go sit down and talk with them and counsel them and try to help them turn their life around. You know, he actually had some uh, apartment buildings that were named after him, some senior, like, assisted living homes that were named after him. So real, you know, my family was a real pillar in the community in Watts, real big into the church community there, real big in just to giving back and trying to up, uplift and build the people up as well. And so I got to see that from my grandmother. And that was, uh, it, it was very, very, you know, just crucial to how I, my outlook on life, right? Like I said, I never accepted that because I was from, Watts or the hood that I was less than it was never taught to me in my home I didn't grow up wealthy I grew up very poor um, you know food sometimes was a struggle didn't have all the nicest clothes but I definitely felt loved definitely felt like someone gave a damn about me and had you know my best interest and I think that's super critical especially growing up in that environment you got to have somebody 
you know, so as you said, my grandmother being the linchpin, absolutely, you know, and my mom, you know, being a single mother back then, she was, you know, very entrepreneurial spirit, but, you know, she definitely dealt with, you know, some sort of mental health problems and, you know, definitely dealt with some kind of substance abuse issues throughout the years and just having to cope. Um, but still, she was also, um, I would say, a strong person that I was able to look at, too, as a person that, you know, kind of persevered and was able to really drive through adversity. She took me with her often as she was getting into any sort of business endeavor. She got into real estate at one point. And so I got to watch this and see it and see like, okay, it's possible. You can absolutely achieve if you put effort into it and go for it. You have a mission, you have a goal. And so that's that, you know, I got that from my grandmother and from my mother. And I was very grateful for that. I think it helped me throughout my life overcome you know, issues, you know, even being in the military growing up in that environment, I just, you know, I felt like I was very prepared, you know, to go in and face any of the challenges that I dealt with even overseas or, you know, dealing with trauma and things like that. You know, I got to see it early. And so, you know, it really made a difference for me growing up, having my grandmother in my life and having that strong person in my life. Well, I would say also yeah. regarding your mom is she also showed you maybe not to the point where you were aware of it at the time, yeah. but that just because you have your demons and we all have our demons, yeah. they don't control you. That's she right. was obviously still able to function in the sense of getting out there, getting work done, taking care of her family yep. while she was battling those demons. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, uh, you know, I'm not, I don't have a very close relationship with my mother, unfortunately, but again, I definitely learned a lot from her. She definitely uh, left a good impression on me in that sense, right? Like, okay, I see it's possible. Like you said, no matter what's going on, if you got a goal and you push to it and you put effort towards it, and don't freaking give up you will have some success in your life and we can't always control the outcome, but damn it, we can try to set the conditions as best we can. And that's what I got a lot from my mother and it, you know, it paid off him, I think in my life. What were you like as far as school? A good student? A oh man, school was always interesting. I, you know, the schools were so poor and horrible. Um, very, you know, very violent, just not conducive. So I did a lot of homeschooling. I went to private school a little bit, you know, uh, Christian school. Right. And, uh, you know, it was okay through middle school growing up. I had asthma, you know, and a lot of that too, you know, dealing with my mom, she was also, you know, kind of a, a sickly person, almost on the side of like a hypochondriac kind of deal. So a lot of that was kind of put on me too. Right. Right. And so I had to overcome that a lot in my life, but man, I was very sick. Uh, always dealing with asthma. I've been in the hospital a bunch of times dealing with that, you know, taking prednisone and breathing treatments, prevental, you name it. I've been down the line when it comes to these things. And so it, you know, I, I was homeschooled for a lot of my life and I went into high school. So I went from like home I did a little bit of middle school, you know, or grade school, maybe a little bit of middle school formally. And then the rest was all homeschool. So I, I feel like I was mostly self-taught, man. I mean, you know, mom was gone. Grandma tried her best to help. Uh, occasionally I had some tutors or whatnot, you know, through like the LA unified school district, right. They had something at the time called teleclass, you know, so I participated in like the first online kind of say. schooling, man. <laughs> and it was kind of cool. I'll never forget. I had the teacher's name was Mr. Lindsay. And he was like one of the most influential teachers I'd ever had in my life because the guy, you know, worked really hard to, you know, teach my timetables and how to just read and how to, you know, really get into comprehension and understanding, you know, that education is actually a way out. And so, I mean, that's crazy. I'll never forget that guy. And so a lot of the things that I learned from him, you know, I still carry to this day, right? Just constantly wanting to learn, constantly wanting to improve, challenge myself, not giving up on something just because I don't understand it, we'll dive in more and get better, right? This is how you free yourself, but through knowledge and education. So that was the early part of my years with school. And like I said, I transitioned out uh, from there. You know, we actually moved out of Watts to... Riverside County, kind of Orange County in 98, 99, right? Kind of a new area for us, obviously, right? We'd, I'd never been to Orange County, Riverside County. Spent a lot of time like in Redondo Beach and, you know, my mom would take us like Palos Verdes sometimes to show us the houses and, you know, we'd go to Brentwood and stuff like just so you can get an idea like, hey, this is what's possible, right? But, you know, they started building new homes in uh, Riverside County, IE, right? That's kind of where you're from, mm -hmm. right? Riverside County out there. You know, I ended up going to Santiago High School. Okay, so um, Corona. Corona. Okay. There you go, South Corona, right? Yeah, there you go. Man, it's been a long time since I've been out there. But uh, so that's where I spent my teen years in high so school. So did you move out right in time to start high school? Man, I moved, yeah, yeah. So we left. Uh, it's kind of a crazy story, man. We had to, we 
we literally like fled our, our home in South Central. The, the gang violence had gotten so crazy. Someone had took over the house next door, turned it into a crack house and marked, you know, our house to just be ransacked through some sort of whatever, you know, graffiti. I mean, it was, it was crazy. The craziest scenario you could possibly imagine. And so, uh, you know, a lot of other things happened. We ended up losing that house too. And we would often go out to South Corona looking at properties. That was how my mom did business. She was young in the real estate, right? And so... There was no family connection that drew you out there? No family connection, nothing at all, just opportunity. Just her looking to get out, right? Just get us out of the hood. That was all... That's the one thing that I think was the driver for my mom. No matter what, no matter how, what kind of person she was, she succeeded in getting me out of the ghetto. And that made all the difference in my life, set my, set my life up for a whole different trajectory, right? So we got out of there, went through that crazy transition of leaving South Central. By some grace of God, we were able to get that home in South Corona, moved out of there. So I was 13, 14, started high school, and it was great. I mean, it was a whole different ball game, man. No longer looking over my shoulder. Uh, actually, let me backtrack. <laughs> <laughs> First week. There's always a bug. Oh, man. Listen, I, look, dude, I've been shot at so many times I can't even remember. Dealt with gang violence, all sorts of stuff, right? But I had never been directly robbed or something like this, right? So, segue. First, move in. First week, I'm all excited. My sister and I, you know, we're driving to the gas station, just getting some gas, right? It's nighttime. And some dude, big old essay type of guy. Rolls up on me as I'm pouring gas, and he goes, "Hey fool, where are you from?" And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, "Hold on a second, where Welcome are we, Corona. man?" I'm like, "Are you serious? Like, no way!" I mean, all in my face. You could smell the beer on his breath, dude. I was fucking scared, right? I'm like, "Oh my god, I'm gonna get robbed. This is gonna kick my ass." And he just starts, you know, what's what you got in your pockets? I was wearing some hat. It said Cisco Systems on it. My sister's boyfriend <laughs> worked at Cisco Systems. And I had a hat. I wore it all the time. And he's like, "What's that hat?" He grabs it, and I'm like, "Oh my god, my sister's in there. She's, you know, she goes inside to go pay for the gas." And then out of nowhere, this other big SA dude comes out, and he's like, "Man, leave that fool alone, right?" <laughs> And I'm like, thank God. And he's like, hey, man, the guy that was in my face, he goes, hey, man, get the fuck out of Corona. I was like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> God. So, man, there were some real issues there. I used to, you know, I'd walk to school. And so I had this real fear every day, like, man, these dudes are going to come get me. And so, I, you know, growing up in the hood, you don't see it. You don't realize how bad it is until you get out of it. And that, and, it, and that's how it was. I didn't realize getting shot at and all. I knew it was bad, and I knew the game volume was bad, but I'd grown up in it. I was accustomed to it. And so getting out of that, it was such a relief, man. And then to be kind of let your thrown guard in your down. face. Oh, I let my guard down like you wouldn't believe, and to have it thrown in your face, man, I really shook me up. So for about a month or two, maybe more, you know, I was really afraid to walk to school every day. But over, you know, time that – that changed and you know the, the environment there was very calm and you know made some great friends there still friends that i'm connected with to this day you know getting out going to high school and being in that environment after coming from you know home school it was a bit of a transition but it just it felt right you know it was it was natural so you know it was a, a big contrast growing up going into high school you know I wrestled. That's when I got into wrestling. I knew right away, like, that was the sport for me. I did nothing else. Were you able to, obviously, overcome your asthma? Overcame the asthma. Yeah, you know, I dealt with it then. But wrestling was huge in that because it taught me that I'm, a, I'm much stronger than I think I am, right? Or, you know, than I thought it was at the time. And then, um, you know, I still use, I would use the inhaler and whatnot. But the person that really helped me get over the asthma, I'm not going to lie, was my wife. When I met her. Man, she, like, changed the game for me mentally, really taught me what I was capable of, really believed in me and pushed me. And so transitioning from high school, I'm still dealing with the asthma. I'm still taking the inhaler. I've still got a breathing machine. And uh, I meet my wife. I'm still wrestling. At this time, I'm coaching. Now I'm graduated from high school. I've moved, I've moved down to San Diego at this point. Um, just beautiful, right? My mom went out there and, you know, initially had some work opportunities. I kind of stayed in Corona for a little bit. And then I went out there to go be with her and 
help her out and see how things went. Don't if, let the secret out. Nobody thinks San Diego's beautiful. <laughs> Good. Yeah, stay out. Keep, actually, keep, if you're, keep that quiet. <laughs> get out of San Diego, actually. It's a little overcrowded now. I want to go back. I'm tired of where, you know, it was beautiful, man. When I first went out there, was, the beach was great. You know, I was right there in Sorrento Valley, Carmel Valley, before that really blew up. And so, I mean, it was just, it was a great environment, man. I thrive there as well, right? Got into coaching MMA, Got into coaching wrestling out there. Transitioned from high school going in. I, I just loved wrestling and the principles it taught me. I kind of want to back up a little bit and just talk about my coach in high school. Well, I, was, I also wanted to ask, what was the drive to wrestling? Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, let's back up a little bit more. My grandmother again. You know, she was always... I want to meet your... I wish I could have met your grandmother. Know. <laughs> Grandma, she's here. She's listening right now. Grandma, come on. This is Paul. No. She's, uh, she was such an incredible person, man. Like I said, when, when she passed, it was very hurtful, but we all got to talk to her. You know, it was over the phone. You know, we live here in Vegas now, and she was in Los Angeles. She lives with my aunt, and she, you know, my aunt is a great person. Take took care of her for a lot of years right up until she passed. But my grandma was a fighter, man. She was a Depression-era baby, survivor, you know, not going to take shit for, you that know. different kind of oh, strong. Oh, my God, just strong, man, and smart and just beautiful. She was very fair-skinned, too. You know, that's, that's the other thing, you know, coming from Louisiana, you know, we had that kind of Creole mix. She's very fair-skinned, so she did a lot of things in her life just to try to excel and push herself forward, where there was getting jobs. She played softball for, you know, one of the, the leagues back in the day, women's leagues. She worked in the military at some capacity. Uh, that's where she met my grandfather who was a sergeant in the Army. Uh, but she was just, man, she was just a tough cookie. What Sounds a, like a cool lady. What a badass. I love her, man. She was so awesome. Um, but she was the one that really pushed me to be strong and, you know, got me into sports. She, she always was out in the front with me playing baseball, right, trying to get me involved, like just keep me moving. And she would always, we'd always watch boxing, wrestling, kickboxing on TV. Like, she was just <laughs> all about it, man. When Mike Tyson, like, got out of jail, like, she ordered the pay-per-view. We, I watched it with my grandmother. It was awesome. She would show me the highlights of Mike Tyson, Muhammad Ali, all the great boxers, man, from back in the day. And that was, like, our thing. We would sit down and watch boxing. Not not really football or anything like that. But um, And then wrestling, man. When the Olympics would come on or if there was ever an opportunity to see wrestling, I'd, guy, come and she'd call me. Look at these guys, man. Oh, and I would just eat that up. I loved it, man. I loved being physical, right? It was just an outlet for me. And I wanted to be strong. Uh, what I knew of my dad at the time, he was a bodybuilder. My mom back in the day was in the fitness industry. They'd owned a gym prior to them getting divorced and splitting up. So that was always kind of a... A pervasive theme in the home, right? Like fitness, exercise, even though my mom wasn't staying on top of it. But for me, it was like, hey, this is how you do it. Do get straight push ups, do some sissy squats, and all these things. And so it was just nor like I knew that once I got into high school, I was like, I want to wrestle, man. I just want to try that. That was the thing that well, I was drawn to. Didn't know how to do it or when or, you know, what weight class. I didn't know much about it. I didn't even really know how to wrestle. I just knew that that was something I wanted to do. Fast forward, move to Corona, brand new high school, jump in. I'm in, you know, the registrar's office getting all signed up. And this big old buff, fit looking dude walks past me and he goes, hey, you're going to wrestle, right? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. That was the coach, right? I throw his name out there, Brian O'Hara. If you're listening, man, you're, you saved my life. Thank you, brother. You, I learned so much from you about perseverance too, and just being strong and not quitting and giving up. And I, you know, he's actually helped create a few guys that are at the teams too, just with that attitude. And, um, you know, meeting him, it was like the first time I had dealt with a man, you know, a real man, like, holy shit. Didn't Com have a, comparatively speaking to the other kids in your class, were you bigger uh, I think I've always been kind of a, a, on the bigger side of things. I've always been very lean. You know, I've never carried a lot of massive weight until later on in life. I added up at one point, I was 260 pounds, jacked out of my mind, lifting three times a day, eating calories on calories, right? But not too big of a kid. When I started, I started off at 145, transitioned to 152, transitioned to 170 as a junior, and then wrestled at 189, kind of 215, but mostly settled at 189. 
Right, so just as, you know, nice transition. That 189.215 is a big jump. It's a big jump, man, and I would bounce kind of around that, right? 189 is where I mostly settled, though, just because that's, you know, just the nature of the beast, right, to fill in the team. But I really transitioned from that, like, sophomore in the junior year and then junior in the senior year. There was a big just jump, man. I was really into lifting weights. Nutrition was huge. UFC, I'd always, man, Scott, I've been watching a UFC since their early days, so I would try to mimic my body style to, like, Mark Coleman and those old-school badass guys because those are who, who I looked up to, man. Mike Tyson, always wanted a nice, thick <laughs> neck, right, and, like, be explosive and move like that. So that was just my attitude. And, and honestly, man, the martial arts and the wrestling and the fitness, like, it just gave me a, a, a compass, right? It, it lined my star, like, okay, that's how I'm going to – that's where I'm strong. This is something that I'm good at. I feel good. Let me pursue this. And fitness, martial arts, wrestling, that transitioned me into jujitsu, transitioned to me into meeting some great guys in the SEAL teams, that transitioned me to me now going into being a special forces operator. So, like, my whole life has kind of followed, you know, that path of just physical fitness, martial arts, wrestling, and I've just – been able to make a great life out of that man when did martial arts come into your life God, martial arts was early you know early did um it was called bk a black karate federation back in the day it was in carson california my aunt who took care of my grandmother was really into that with her kids and so i, would, I got into martial arts very early probably you know, maybe eight or nine. Maybe Is there earlier. anything your family wasn't into? Man, I got a <laughs> dynamic, crazy family, man. It's crazy. No, they're very. It's interesting. You know, most most of them are college educated. At least all the women on the family college educated. They're married. All the kids are college educated. Like, I, I think it came from just that attitude. My grandfather. You know, he was an artist. He was a chemist. Um, you know, he, he had a, a mortuary. Man, he started one of the first black bombing in, in colleges in Atlanta you know, a school where you can learn how to, the art of embalming, right? And I It really know. sounds like failing in your family was not an option. You know what, man? No, absolutely not. Pushing, driving, succeeding, that that's what I grew up with. It was never, you're black, you're in the hood, you're disenfranchised. Absolutely not, man. Who gives a shit? Ghetto is a state of mind. Being an inward is a state of mind. Absolutely not. You're better. You're just as good as anybody else. Let me show you. We can go be in this environment, in this neighborhood. The police, I got police in my family. My uncle was a, God rest his soul, he passed. He was a sheriff for a lot of years, L.A. County sheriffs, worked vice, you know, dealt with narcotics, you name it. So, like, that was never a thing. Absolutely not. You can purely succeed. The military, we gave a lot of love to the military. and The grandfather, my aunt, I've got an uncle that was served in the military. So, it's like... No, there, there's no limitations. Push forward. Do what you got to do. If you fail, that's on you. Pick yourself up. Keep going. That was the attitude. So you grew up pretty much your whole life doing martial arts. Picked up the wrestling in high yep. school. Coming towards the end of high school, what were you looking at as your future? What was kind of on your horizon? Because I know you said you ended up down in San Diego. Was that your path that you were on? You know what? Deep down inside, I feel like I was always going to be in the military. I just knew it since I was a kid. When I was a little kid, that's who I looked up to were military, police. I always wanted to be a police officer, a SWAT guy in particular. <laughs> always loved the Navy SEALs, Special Forces. Man, I'd watch all the movies, read all the books. When the Discovery Channel documentaries would come on, I'd record them. Have like a super compilation mixtape <laughs> that I made at the house, dude, of just all the coolest badass military stuff I could find. But I had this asthma thing. And so I just put it in the back burner as something that was a pipe dream. But I'm going to try to live to that standard physically, the way I'm going to carry myself, the way I speak, hold my chin up high, right? And so I just embodied that attitude growing up. And like I said, man, I always wanted to do it. And I met my wife. And like I said, she's the one that was really the catalyst to like, okay, you've got these dreams and you've got this, these desires. You have asthma. She's like, you're wrestling eight hours a day, coaching, you know, working with fighters. Breathing. And you're, she's like, you're fine. She was also going through nursing school at the time too. So, I mean, my wife is super lot, man. I wish she could have been here today too. She's great. But she was the one that really was like, okay, it's time to put foot to ass. We're going to have a family. I want you to be the man that you want to be, the man you need to be, and I will support you and that was it. I was like, wow, thank you. And so I knew just, just from 
okay, so now let me back up a little bit. So I'm now I'm coaching, I'm wrestling, I'm working with these fighters. And then, you know, I start making some friends with some pretty cool guys. I'm like, man, who the frick are these guys? They're all fit. They're jacked. Turns out these dudes are Navy SEALs, man. And I'm like, whoa, holy crap. I've never met a Navy SEAL in my life, but I've been watching this my whole life. You know, there was a couple SWIG guys in there. There were a couple Army Special Forces guys in there. And they were all just would come in and train. And so I started talking to them and just really loving the lifestyle, man. Just really digging in and understanding what their day-to-day is like and just seeing the attitude and watch how they carry themselves. I was like, dude, yeah. That's exactly the kind of guy that I want to be. And they would tell me, dude, you freaking fit in perfectly. Let's get out. You know what I mean? We, you know, if you want to go for it, here's, here's how you do it. This is the process. See what you're made of. And so, you know, I talked to my wife about it. And for some reason, man, when you have your mindset on something and you're really serious about it, for some reason, you draw that kind of energy into your life, right? Whether it be fitness, whether you're money motivated, if it's negative, you're going to draw negative shit into your life. And so for me, it was like, man, I just want to be around high caliber people all the time. And man, I just kept running into special forces guys, befriending these guys. And it was only natural. My wife, she supported me once I decided like, look, I, I, this is what I want to do. I want to go be a special operations guy. I wasn't sure where. Initially, I was looking at the army. She, she implored me to look at all the options Ended up talking to some good friends of mine that were SEALs and SWICs, and they convinced me that that was the better option, in my opinion. And it, and it of totally course, was. they convinced you. Of that course, because I was like, dude, I was going to go to the <laughs> Army, man. And then I thought about, like, where I was going to be, right? And it just I, I, it just wasn't working, right? I'd gone to MAPS, and I was doing all these things, and they weren't really given contracts at the time. What year you know, is this? this? Was, this was, God, I started the process in, like, 2000 and maybe eight, nine. And it was just weird at, at the time trying to get into San Diego MEPS and like they just weren't giving out contracts, man. It was the strangest thing. Like you can get in and be like Motor T or something like that. And I was told like, okay, look, man, we'll get you in. You can be Motor T. We'll get you a Ranger option and all this and that. We'll give you nine thousand dollars. Sure, and I was we like, will. Oh, cool. I'll give me. <laughs> okay, you, I got the option. And so I remember getting the paperwork. I went and talked to a few, a few buddies of mine. Actually, talk, a good friend of mine was a uh, uh, eighteen Alpha. He was an officer in special operations, and he looked at my contract. He's like, "You will absolutely not take this. This is bullshit." Like, no, that dude saved my life because. I would have jumped in full bore. I just wanted to be in the military. Are you trying to say that recruiters lie? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. They're not all created equal. Come get me. Come get me. All right. Look, sometimes, look, man, they, these guys have a job or whatever, and they're going to do what they got to do. Okay? They got a slot to fill. They got a slot to fill, man. But you know what? It's up to you as an individual, though. You have control literally up until the day that you bounce out of there. Make sure that you read your paperwork. Make sure that you talk to people. At least, that are actually doing the thing that you want to do. Seek them out, okay? So no matter what you're trying to do when you go into the military, do your homework, do your research. Yes, it can absolutely improve your life, change your life, but you can make the wrong decision and be in the wrong MOS and fucking hate your life. And and what good are you then? You know what I mean? What, it crushes your dreams. It crushes everything about the military that you wanted to go into it for in the first place. So really dive in and do your homework. And that was a crucial lesson that I learned early, man, you know? Buddy looked at the paperwork, was like, this isn't right. It's not put together right. Like, we need to readdress this. To talk to another friend of mine who convinced me to go talk to, you know, another guy at the teams. Looked at it the same, was like, look, man, no, you, I would. this is what I would do. And so I backed off. And I was like, okay, no, this is not really what I want to do. Let me go talk to the Navy guys. And I talked to the Navy guys, and it was just a different experience altogether, right? Then I find out, oh, God, I got to do the PST, like, what's that, right? So, man, that was a whole nother process. So, first PST ever. No idea what I'm walking into. It's down at San Diego in Coronado at the pool, right? People, if you know, you know. Get there, and there's, like, tons of dudes, man. I'm like, whoa, what is this? I thought it was going to just be me and, like, another another guy competing, doing the swim, the push-up, the run, and all that, the physical screening test. 2008, I'm sure there's Dude, a lot of people wanting this, to be – Oh, my God. This was right around probably – yeah, 2008, 2009. I would imagine they probably had bands in the sense of, hey, these first 30 guys, and then we'll catch the rest. Pretty much, man. And, I mean, when you, when you, when you get into the pool – and it's like stacked 10 deep each lane. <laughs> and it's like, okay, go. What? Oh, man. So I jump in. I'm thinking, you know, I can't swim. I've been swimming my whole life, going to the beach and, you know, tapped into surfing a little bit. I fucking, I got this. Everybody's telling me I got this. Dude, I jump in there and I'm like crawl stroking. 
I get yelled at. Dude, what the fuck are you doing? Kid, you got a side stroke. You got a, you know, or, or frog stroke, whatever. Right? And I was like, oh, oh. and it just hit me, man. Like, holy shit. I don't, I'm not, I'm not prepared for this. Struggled through it. Got through the first piece. You know, the, the pool was just a disaster. The run was okay. The push-ups were okay. But it almost, it felt like, man, I just feel like I'd never worked out before in my life. Just that, like the pressure of it all was very real. This is the first time I'm not wrestling. It's not high school. It's not a, you know, a tournament. Like I'm competing. This is for real. This is for real. Like I want to do this and man, I'm not doing it. I'm failing. And so that was like a real test, right? You failed your first PST. What are you going to do now? And so, fuck, man, I struggle with that. I don't want time. this. This isn't sarcastic, but part of me wishes that you telling me I called and talked to my grandmother, and she said, <laughs> "Get your ass back in that pool and try again." Honestly, my grandmother was with me the entire time through that process. Helped my wife while I was on deployment. Called her, checked on her. Grandma was super critical in my success at the teams, man. Like, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because. Yeah, if it wasn't for her, I don't think I would have even been the kind of person that I am to go for that, right? So, you know, grandma was there. Wife, everybody was behind me. Absolutely not. Nope. Let's get back after it. So, messed up. Got through the process, though. And they just told me, hey, man, look, come back, right? You really want it? Come back. Let's see what you're made of. And so, I dedicated months of time to get better and to go back and I would fail something or, you know, it was just, wasn't good. And I'd be off or pass, but really you had to be in a certain level to move because they were only giving contracts to a few guys throughout the whole country. There's passing and then there's passing. And then there's, yes, <laughs> getting it done, being outstanding. That's what mattered when you were doing these PSTs because in San Diego, way different ball game than somebody in like North Dakota trying to get a contract, right? Maybe one dude is there, a die motivator, he screens you, you're out. San Diego, hundreds of dudes are trying to compete all at once and they're only giving out a contract maybe this right. year. So, man, I really worked. I went back. You know, I talked to the recruiter that I was working with. He was a great guy. God, I wish I could remember his name, man. He was awesome. The, the, the recruiter that I was dealing with with the Navy – would meet up with me at like four thirty five in the morning. We'd go to 24 hour fitness in San Diego and swim. And he taught me how to actually get after with time me, push me, coached me through the process, man. And God is, that's why it's so important to have good people in your life. You know, seek them. Maybe if you have one person that can push you and drive you, it's going to make such a difference. And so that guy really pushed me through, really showed me like what putting out is at this point, what you need to do to reach the standard. And man, I showed up every freaking week to do those PSTs to stack myself up and to show up and eventually move through that process. And ultimately ended up getting a call. Hey man, you know, somebody dropped out and I, and they were like, okay, we got you. You're good guy. You're doing great. You know, the pull-ups are great. Everything's good. And you know, maybe we'll try to get you in, in a couple months, right? We're looking to get you a contract in a couple months. Went home. Let's say I did the PST on a Friday. I get a call like Friday night. And they were like, we need you to leave on Monday. And I was like, holy shit. What? Monday? Okay. And that was it. Hard and fast. I had to make the decision. Am I going to go or am I going to sit back home and not take the opportunity? And this is 2008? This was 2009, 2009. Yeah. Right around there. And so um, my wife was pregnant at the time. I had a young daughter too, right? And it was like, yep, I'm leaving on Monday. Let's go do it. <sighs> Said bye to the family that weekend. I think it was like Memorial Day weekend. I have a man, it's so funny. You forget like days and times a lot, but it was some holiday weekend, right? And I was going to leave that Monday or Tuesday. And uh, that was it. it. It was a hard and fast decision. Yep, you made it. Okay, now it's in your face. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to take it or are you going to leave it? Now, at this point in time, are you thinking, so you're how old at this point? I was 24, I think, 23, 24. And in your mindset, was this a long-term thing, life for 20 years, or were you thinking just an enlistment, let me see if what it's like? or I, You know what, man? At the time, I just wanted to get in. I just knew that that's what I needed to do. That's what I wanted to do. I put so much time and effort into it. I'd been training, taking odd jobs to train, you know, just to keep 
you know, some money to, to pay for food and keep the family intact. And I just dedicated all my time and energy to crushing these PSTs and getting in the community. And so whether I had stayed long-term or not, I didn't care. I just wanted, this is what I was doing. <sighs> Move forward. I'm in it going through boot camp, and it's freaking awesome. I love it. I'm surrounded by the baddest ass dudes I'd ever been around. Everybody's got the goal. Everyone's pushing. Everybody wants to succeed. So many guys in in the you know in the boot camp detachment trying to make it. You see, that's when you first start to see guys fall off and quit and go to the and you're like, man, this is real. This is crazy. And so even then, though, I knew before I before I even left, I was training with a buddy of mine who was already a SEAL, great guy. Um, I don't, don't want to name names, but he's a great guy. He's now a, a physician, which is awesome. But he said, guy, I was like, how do you do this? You know, what's the secret, right? Everybody wants to know what's the secret. He's like, you know what, dude? You just got to decide that you're not going to quit. That's it. Make a decision that you're not going to quit. And then fucking go for it. Just every day. Just show up. Give it your all. Don't quit. And that was the attitude that I rolled with. My attitude going through any of the evolutions that were super difficult. Like, I, I am an anvil in the water, dude. First of all, being a swick is not easier. You're in the water all the time. We don't play on the land too often. So you got to be super water proficient. And so, man, I would be in that water sinking. They're giving you bricks to try to tread with. I'm like, I've never treaded with a brick. I didn't know I was supposed to do that, man. Like, oh shit, I didn't get that in the manual, right? And so you just get hit with so many different things and you watch guys all around you quit. But in my mind, that always rang true. I've never been a quitter. I'm not going to start now. So fuck it. I'm just going to die here. And that, to me, was more honorable than going back home and telling my wife that I could not execute. I would have rather them tell me, you, you're not good enough, and then bounce before I'd ever quit anything. And so that carried me through, man. I've been through a lot, just like everybody that goes through this process. But at the end of the day, I was just so fucking grateful. Like, when I actually got to the beach in San Diego and saw the O course saw the buds compound you know we all train on the same compound it was like wow dude i had reached nirvana like this is where i'm supposed to be and my buddy too great guy he'd always say like man come on you train on the beach you're in the sun like what there's nothing to what complain. are you complaining about dude, and he's like god you're a meathead all right G give in and go where you're strong man enjoy the process and that is you know kind of what we were talking about earlier you got to apply, like the end state, sure, that's great. I wasn't thinking like, oh, am I going to do this for six years? Am I going to do this for 10 years, 20 years? Like, it was just every day. The process is what I attach the, the good vibes to, the reward to. At the end of the day, when you're done getting your ass kicked out there and you're miserable, like, I just looked forward to getting back in, playing some Xbox in the barracks, man, and getting some sleep and maybe sneaking a dip in. Yeah, I said it. I don't give a <laughs> damn. Come get me. You know who I am. Sneaking a dip in or something because that was your little reward, man. It was like, yes, made it through the day. And so that's what would carry me through, man. And then, you, like I said, you're surrounded by the best dudes in the world, man. You really do make those great bonds. And it was just, like I said, the best experience of my life, man, going through that process. It showed me what I was capable of, that dreams really can come true, man. It's not bullshit. It's not a fairy tale. Positive thinking actually works. You know, really, really leaning towards these things. You're going to find the right people. You're going to learn so much along the way about yourself. And then, hey, man, that's how you succeed. So how long did you – how many years total did you do in the military? So total year – did six active, and then I did three in the reserves, right? And that wasn't all so great. Dealt with a lot of injury stuff that I had, over, had to overcome. You know, traumatic brain injuries, the whole nine yards. I mean, it, it was pretty, pretty incredible. You know, did multiple, multiple deployments overseas. <laughs> Got pretty lucky. You know, I, I had a pretty incredible career from my, you know, in, in my standard, right? Like, I only wanted to be involved with the latest and greatest, like, what's going on at the community. I want to be involved, right? And I got an opportunity to get involved with a, a great unit there. You know, we're really working like new technology and standing up this new group. And, you know, out the gate, man, I got to take it to the highest level, work with tier one operators, really got to see what that lifestyle is like and what a man out, out the gate, you know, being a new guy and getting to work with these guys, these seasoned, super seasoned operators that have to screen to get in 
you know, we're talking about SEALs and SWICs that are seasoned guys screening to go to damn neck, SEAL Team 6 as we call it, right? Unbelievable opportunity, man. And so that was the bulk of my career, getting to work alongside these guys, seeing how that community operates, seeing the efficiency, the dedication, the energy, man, the the brotherhood there. I mean, God, I couldn't have asked for a better career, man. And so, yeah. That first six years, was that your complete enlistment? Yeah, that was my first enlistment, yeah, and that was it. When, when you started coming to the end of it, was it obvious that – I'm not going to be re-enlisting. You know what? No, I fought it to the bitter end. What started happening there is I was gone all the time. That whole time, I was literally, from the day I left, when I told you I got the phone call, snowballed. I was almost never home. Never got to see my kids. Never really got to see my wife. We were drifting apart. It was unfortunate, but we had, we had such a deep love for each other. We were together right. before I was in the military. And so it was the hardest decision of my life. Yeah, to walk away from that. But it was the greatest and best decision, too, because I had to choose. I couldn't have two wives. I couldn't have two families. And I just saw the in, the out, the outcome of that, right? If I'd have stayed in versus not. And I had a good friend there that told me to my face, like, look, man, I've never seen a guy didn't, that didn't regret not choosing their family first especially the shit that we were doing and dealing with. And it's hard to, it's hard to look at it at the time, but we get wrapped up in the job. Yeah. And we think that, well, I can't leave. They need me. Yeah. But the thing is the day you walk out that door, trust me, there's somebody right behind you and they ain't going to miss you. Ain't that the truth, man. But your family on the other hand, and, and I ask this often of the, the, the guests who are former military. Yeah. Is it possible to strike that balance for an entire career? Or or how what needs to change? Because unfortunately, that's such a common story of these guys that talk about doing 20 years. Yeah. They come out and I lost my family at some point in time. Yeah. That's a tough one, man. It really is because you're right. Your identity is attached to this job. It is. It is everything to me. I couldn't be halfway. And I mean, I gave everything to it. And it's a very unforgiving job. The world does not give a fuck about your family. It's not just the military. It's the nature of the business. It's you're dealing with people at their worst. You're seeing humanity at its worst. That comes along with its own set of issues. It changes you inside. You know, I became a very, like a straight fucking predator, man. Like everything was just op, op, op. I didn't care about anything else. Give me the beer and give me the op. That's it. And so that just had a horrible, horrible, you know, effect on my family life, effect on my personal life, how I conducted business. You know what I mean? It just, I just turned into something else. And so that was me. I think, you know, some people can have a career and it works for them. Honestly, though, the way that we were operating and when you're on a high op tempo, very difficult. I don't know how you pull that off. I don't because, like I said, you can't be married to the teams and your families. You got to give more energy to one. And if you don't give your all in this job, especially if you're in a combat situation or in a very, you know, dangerous situation in this business you lose your life worse you kill someone else and take their family situation out of whack right so it's like you know i've seen some guys able to pull it off and they were okay uh but very rarely um and i'm not knocking anybody but i think if you're going in at least to a combat role or the special operations community you know you need to be very cognizant of that and be honest like it's you're going to be gone a lot whether you want to or not, not necessarily just deployments, but just the nature of the beast, the training pipeline itself is tremendous, man. It's almost two years long from the moment you go in, you know, depth through graduation, almost a two year long process of you being away, being at the barracks, having to miss this. I've missed a ton of birthdays, missed all my anniversaries. Fortunately, I was home for Christmas on, you know, on the occasions, but I mean, you're, there's no option. You don't get to say no, right? So, well, at the time you didn't think you could say no. Yeah. At the time. And, yes. And, and more importantly, you were not made to feel like you could say no. Very right. That yes. Yes. 
you can absolutely say no. But again, too, right? You built that bond with your guys. You you play a critical role, just like you do as a father or a husband or a brother or whatever, right? You play a critical role. So if you're absent, then holy shit, that you perceive that as like, man, I'm letting my family down. I'm letting my brothers down. I'm letting my country down. Man, you, you go down this weird cascade. I went through all of that. Never turned down a deployment I should have. Absolutely. I think, you know, looking back retrospect, I wish I absolutely wish I would put my family first in more occasions when I had the opportunity to. But for somebody who might be in that same position right now. Yeah. And I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. And I apologize for this. Were you talking with your wife or was it nothing but arguments? Because I can imagine... I, I don't want to assume I understand the story, but I can understand in in an indirect way. Yeah. Your wife kind of going, "Hey, pick which family are you gonna you gonna go with? You gonna go with your family, or you're gonna go with that family?" Man, again, I, I'll credit to my wife. She was super supportive of me. She was. She hated it as much as I did because I think our relationship was so freaking close. That it just hurt, man. You know what I mean? When we were gone from each other, we got, I had a brand new baby who I had no, like, yes, we had a a relationship, but I felt like, man, I'm gone. He doesn't even know me. You know, my daughter, we had this huge, awesome, great relationship. Now I'm gone. I'm an absentee father. And so in my head, that's how it felt. I just felt like I was a ghost in and out of the house. My wife, you know, I'd come off of the deployment and then I'd come back home. And then, like, I knew probably in two weeks I might have to go again. And so I would hold it in to the last minute. And I just hated telling her, like, I got to go again. And it just became this, like, to the point where it was like, okay, you know, we got to just eat this and accept it. And she never, like, gave me ultimatums or any crazy shit. But and I wasn't implying that she did. Oh, no, I just I, I no, kind of no, wonder no. if if in an indirect way that was or were you able to as adults sit down and have conversations or did it almost kind of devolve to just kind of ignoring the elephant in the room? You know, there was a lot of that, the ignoring of the elephant in the room, but we did have a very candid conversation, you know, a couple times, but there was one in particular where she was just like I can't sustain this. And I was, you know, at first I took it all, you know, what do you mean? I'm out there working. And, uh, but I got it, too. I'm like, yeah, if I were in her shoes, holy shit, man. I don't think I'd be able to hold it together as well as she did. What a rock, man. Like, we don't give a lot of the mamas credit for what they deal with when we're gone. Um, and and so I, I say that in all earnesty. Like, no, she, she supported me so much to this. I knew that my kids were taken care of when I was gone. I didn't worry about it. I knew that she was there. I knew that she was crushing it and taking care of it. No matter what the fuck I was doing, I knew that those kids were taken care of. So in a way, she really gave me a lot of energy to be the person that I needed to be while I was gone to survive and execute and do all that. But I knew it was killing her too. And that to me was preserving our family and our relationship because I knew there wasn't any other way around it because I'm not going to say no. I'm not right. going to back off. I'm going to be me. I knew I had to cut it. And so it was difficult, but like I said, one of the better decisions, and I'm glad I made it. You mentioned dealing with some injuries. Were any of the injuries yeah. significant enough that they could have potentially forced you out? Uh, I think after a while, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, you hold a lot of things in, too, because you don't want to – one, accept the fact that there's something different about you, your performance, that you're hurt, you know, hurt. You know, I was dealing with a lot of, like, migraines. I get real auras, and, you know, I was losing sensation in my fingers, losing sensation in my, you know, head, different areas, and my attitude was horrible. I had this crazy aggression, and, you know, I was drinking like fucking crazy, man. I was killing myself with alcohol. No sleep, up for days and days at a time, my body weight would fluctuate, and ah, oh, man, it, it was it was just crazy, you know. Dealing with traumatic brain injuries, dealing with injuries in general, you know, they weigh on you, man. That anxiety builds up in you, and it could absolutely destroy you. But you know, I knew um, I knew that it was time to wrap it up. You know, from the mental health aspect side of it, yeah. did you ever seek any professional I treatment? I did. I did inside. 
Um, and it was probably the most valuable thing that I could have ever done at that point. I things had just come to a head, you know, there was suicidal ideations, the whole nine yards, especially when it came close to getting out. Um, it was crazy, man. It, it was just rough because I didn't think I could do anything else either. Right. I had put so much time and energy into this. I took some of that energy out too, like negatively towards my wife. I blame her. Like God, you're making me get out and I got all these dreams and goals. <laughs> all this bullshit. Uh, but in reality, she was saving my life because she could see it. She's outside. And, and I think, you know, we got to give credit to our spouses and our people that are with us that see us day to day. They know us, especially if they knew us prior to the military. And like I said, she's a whip, man. She's super on it, educated, highly educated nurse, you know, bachelor's in nursing. And so she's really big on the psychology piece too. And so she was able to see other things too that I was dealing with. And was like, whoa, we need to address this. And she stood by my side through the worst of the worst times, especially with that transition piece because I got out and I was just lost. I had no idea what I was going to do. I knew I needed to get out. I knew I would come to and find my way at some point. But there was just patch where I was just like, I don't know what to do, man. I'm lost. And I was still trying to keep up with a lot of those old behaviors. You know, I was very aggressive. The way I talked to people wasn't kind or, you know, I wasn't very approachable. Where before I was always approachable, you know what I mean? Like, that's what I said. Having my wife in my life like that, and, and I'm so fortunate that we're still together. Because, man, I couldn't imagine being without her at this point, too, now and giving it up for some of the things that I believed in at that time, you know. So what year did you get out active duty? I, Active duty 2016. And is there a single event or, or a specific period where you actually can notice or remember that you kind of changed back to, I'm going to give it a normal you, where you weren't as aggressive, where you weren't as short-tempered, or is it something you still work on you today? You know what, man? I'm going to be honest with you. It's something I work on daily. You know, every day I, I work to improve and be a better person, you know, watch how I talk to people, you know. Give people respect and dignity because you get this crazy ego too, man. When you're surrounded by these guys and, and you're out there doing what you're doing and you get this air of bravado, man, this attitude that you it doesn't necessarily work as well on the outside because people don't understand it. And if you can't clearly articulate that to people, then, you know, it's just totally lost. Right. And so you just come across as a very negative down at, you know, bad person. Right. And so I saw it mostly though with my own family, the way I would talk to my kids, the way I would talk to my wife and, you know, be snappy and have little attitude things. Like, dude, that's something that I had to really dial in. Did you ever make the mistake of snapping to your grandmother? <laughs> Man, my grandmother to this day, the one of the last things she said to me. I just keep coming back to dude, your grandmother. let me go back to grandma. <laughs> and why, look, grandma all the time w would threaten me jokingly with violence. <laughs> I will knock your head off with this broomstick. Take this pot and bang it upside your head. One of the last things I, my grandmother told me after, she said, I love you, baby. Now, you know I'll still knock you upside your head if you act up. Jennifer, my wife, she's like, you better keep him in line because I'll knock his head. I was like, God, Grandma, I would never. And, and yeah, she, man, she was such a, an amazing person in my life. Like I said, just her, too, being there with my wife while I was out, calling on her, checking on her, checking on the kids. Like, just being a real grandma, just, you know, we didn't, we, we don't have that very much in our family, both my wife or my side, but grandma was that person, man, that really looked out all the time, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So, you alluded to this, you really didn't have a game plan for your exit out. Yep. What, what, what did you end up doing when here's, you got out? Here's the attitude. I knew when I got out that I'm like, okay, I got to devote completing my education, one. I needed to get my degree, and I'm like... The job, I have no idea. I, I, you know, initially I wanted to get into medicine. You know, I thought about going to medical school. You know, I've always had a knack for science. Always wanted to be in, in the medical field in some capacity. And so that was like my aim. I'm like, I'm going to get out. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to go be a doctor or something like this, right? And I get out and it's, you know, I get signed up for school. That whole process was a whole, a whole nother beast, right, to dive into. Um, but ultimately I did end up completing my degree, which was great. It, that, that was the one thing that I stuck to the most. And it gave me like your new mission, a new mission, right? I got to do this. 
then came like, okay, now, so I got the degree. What, like, what am I going to do? Right. And so did you choose to go in person or online? I did online. Right. It, it worked for me. It was just, yeah, I'd set it up before I'd got out, which was great. And so I just kind of stuck with the process because it always gave me at the end of the day, something to do, something that kept me in line, something that kept my mind engaged, gave me a purpose, right? You know, fortunately, you know, going to having a GI bill, it gave me a little bit of financial support too. And then, um, I, I got real down because I was like, man, I just, I don't want to do, I got into the military cause I didn't want to live an ordinary kind of day to day, nine to five life. And so I, um, I reached out to people, right. Just started asking friends, right. You got to reach out to my network and that's how I got in touch with the honor foundation too. And the honor foundation, it was something I looked into prior to getting out, but it, I thought one of the criteria is like, you got to have a bachelor's degree, right? To participate. And so I was always kind of keeping it on the back burner. And as I started moving towards that progress, I was like, man, I think it would be a good opportunity to try to just at least surround myself with some good people that are trying to do. It's an amazing organization. Things. I've, I've interviewed several people now who are graduates yeah. of it. It's, it saved my life. It changed my life completely on the, it just put me on the right trajectory. Like you said, the people that you surround yourself with matter so much. Other than that, walk the, walk this earth alone, man. Because if you're around the wrong, people are going to bring you down. People are going to try to crush you if you're doing good things. And the Honor Foundation was just this entity of good and positive energy. And they really were just in my life at the right time, man. You know, I was already making a transition. Like I said, I was dealing with alcohol abuse. It was it was incredible, but I had made a decision like I'm going to cut it completely. I've been sober, got almost six years now, five years now. Congratulations! Thank you, man. It was that was a hell of a transition. Same for Dip, right? Got off all that stuff, and um, the Honor Foundation came into my life at that time, and I, I just dove in completely, gave a hundred percent my all into making this transition work, work for my family, work for myself, give myself my dignity back. And God damn it, it worked. You know, I just, I pushed through it. And yeah, I've had to deal with some adversity, made some different career changes here and there. I always said, just love the startup environment. I like that kind of, you know, <sighs> hey man, you get to make your own way, right? Just like the teams, you play a part, right? Into the bigger goal. And so I kind of have aligned myself with different startups and kind of working on my own thing to kind of make my own way through this world. And honestly, man, having the honor foundation behind me was a tremendous valuable. It was just unbelievably valuable for, for my success. And so I, you know, I give them a lot of credit for helping me get in alignment and, uh, you know, tremendous for my family. You know, everyone there is just tirelessly working to help our guys transition and my story is not unique at all. There's guys that get out and it's just like, man, you hit this wall because fuck, you have your identity tied up into this special operations thing, the military thing, no matter what. And sometimes you get out and then boom, that reality hits you like, oh God, now you're on your own. What do you do? So it's always good, man, to have somebody on your side that can help guide you. And that's what the Honor Foundation was for me. And I'll always give back and help them no matter what. I still try to reach out and talk and, you know, refer people that need to, and especially guys that have families that need help. Hey, man, there's a there's another way to do this. You don't need to do it alone. So the startup company that you're with now, is yeah. that what brought you to Vegas? Uh, no, 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 no. Transition to Vegas, you know, COVID hit. It was crazy being in California. Man, we're just locked down. Um, you know, unfortunately I had lost my position at a company I was working with. And so I had to rapidly make adjustments, you know, fortunately been down this road before and, you know, we kind of knew, you know, that we were going to had to make some radical adjustments. Right. And so me and my family, we hit the road, man, went on a road trip, which was great. We were looking at different areas to live anyway. So we went down to Florida for some time, you know, checked it out there. It was beautiful. And then uh, my daughter, she's a a kicker, man. God, she's such a, a tremendous human being. I love my daughter to death. She uh, she was accepted to God, twenty different colleges. Ended up settling wow. at USC. And so uh, good for her. Yeah, man, I'm unbelievably proud of her. She's another person here that's like my compass. You know what I mean? That keeps me focused, keeps me centered, makes sure that I'm on on task. Right, little badass. I love her, Kiki. I love you to death. If you listen, when you listen. Um, yeah, she she's at USC, 
And we didn't want to be in California, per se, just because of how things are. And so Vegas is kind of that happy medium. We're not too far, but, you know, we're close enough. And we actually ended up meeting some really great people. So we've been out here a little over a year now, right? It's a beautiful place. Love it. Great friends out here now. Son's happy. He's got some great friends. And, uh, you know, we're not too far from our daughter. She comes and visits from time to time. And, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it was a nice transition for us, man. Love it here. Love the mountains. That's something that I'm very, you know, attracted to just that I want to be around. I love the hiking and the outdoors. There's just a lot to do out here in Vegas. And so it's really just kind of become our, our new home now. We love it. Now the, the startup you're with now, yep. did it align with your interest and your likes or was it simply seeking out a startup? 100% a fortuitous situation, right? Just having a casual conversation, talking with, you know, some friends of mine from the Honor Foundation and, you know, just running through some ideas, right? My wife and I started working on an online business when COVID happened and, you know, that ended up being successful and working out for us and allowed us to travel and be together and spend time together. But then there was just, I was looking for some, I'm always looking for an opportunity of some sort, Right. And I love the fitness industry. Like I said, it's, it's been the one thing that I've always been able to rely on for myself. And one thing that I just, I love coaching. I love helping people. I love seeing people change and adapt and get stronger. Love watching them evolve mentally and just seeing how much of a difference that makes in their lives. And I started talking to, you know, some friends of mine at the Honor Foundation about that. And they were like, you know what? We, I got to introduce you to this particular individual. And I had to talk with the CEO of our company right now, just casually. And I mean, it, it was like the stars aligned. Values, the desire to help people, to, to try to bring value to the world, improving people's health, improving people's mental health, everything just aligned perfectly. And we ended up, you know, getting together. And here I am now with this incredible startup where, you know, it's all about human performance and helping people no matter what issues that they're working through, there's a pathway that you can always track things, the, the source of any sort of ailment, disease, you name it, whether it be mental health or physical, there's a way that you can disrupt that and optimize your performance. And we seek to do that with each person that we work with, and we have incredible success doing it. The reason why I asked yeah. is because so many people, I think, get bogged down in the, I want to do something, but I don't know what I want to do. And I honestly believe that if you if you come back to what do you enjoy yep. and then find a way to make that a job. That's a fact. You want to really make some money? You want to really have fulfillment in your life? One, I think there's no greater way to do that than giving back, being in some sort of service, adding value to someone else's life. Anything that you can give, share knowledge-wise, and help someone improve their life, talk about fulfillment. Yes, but if you can really go for your passion, the thing that you know you're strong at, absolutely, man. That's what you need to put a lot of energy into because anything else is noise. Yeah, you got to do what you got to do to put food on the table and take care of your family and support yourself and have dignity. Take that. Sometimes you got to go through that low door. Sometimes you got to take that shitty job. But if you're moving, moving towards your passions and constantly seeking to improve, constantly seeking to get that next step, you will find that right position for yourself or you will start that company yourself and you will find fulfillment there and have tremendous success. And it's got to be about the process, right? The outcome, yeah, we all think that once we get the million bucks or the car or the girlfriend or the house or whatever, that yeah, everything's going to be rosy and great. Then you get it and it's fucking ephemeral, man. That's why you have to follow your passions and you have to give back. That's the only thing that I've seen work. I deal with people all the time that are some of the wealthiest people in the world, man. And they're dealing with insecurities and all sorts of things that we all deal with. Passion and having a purpose in life is key to success, man. And did you say that you're working, you're, a lot of your clients are military members about to transition out? No, some of them, most of our clients are, you know, either high level executives, some are athletes, some people are, you know, all from all walks of life and in industry, but you know, they have a desire to improve or they find that they have some sort of issue that they're trying to work with. You know, medicine is great, but you can't always fix everything with a pill. 
Sometimes you need to go a little deeper. And I think that's where we really excel, right? We really dive deep and trying to figure out like, okay, what is the actual root cause of whatever this issue is? Or if you want to step up your performance, here's the most efficient process based off of experience. Because a lot of the guys that are with us are special forces operators, or, you know, they've had some sort of experience in the biotech field. On your staff. On our staff. And, uh, you know, you got a wealth of knowledge to draw from, both practical knowledge and then you've got the deep research and the deep academic knowledge as well. Marry that information up along with, you know, like, as I mentioned, we take, you know, we look at blood work, we look at everything, every aspect of your life and see where we can make the most efficient and most powerful change that sticks. Well, we've hit all the way around the bush now. What's the company? Company. So company's called Fount, F-O-U-N-T. Okay. So you can check it out, fountain.bio, break it down for you. You can take a look at, you know, what our mission is, you know, how we started. And, you know, if you want to get access to it, that's an opportunity too. We're growing, you know, we're developing our business now. Um, you know, so there's a little bit of a wait list for people that want to jump on, but Hey, you can absolutely go to the website, take a look at it, see what we're doing, get on that wait list and see if you can become a part of the family with us. I know you got to get to another meeting. Yes. Any last advice or any military members on their transition out? You know what? Um, the biggest thing that I would say is, you know, don't give up, one. If you're having a rough transition, give yourself some time to go through this piece. Respect your family. Respect yourself. If you're doing something that's hurting you, stop. Seek help if you can't. It's there. There's people out there that have your interests in mind. And just don't give up, man. There's, there's so much to live for. There's so many great opportunities out there. Organizations like the Honor Foundation and a few others that are available. Seek them out. Talk to someone. Don't be alone. Don't sit there and wallow, man. Listen, we, you, we come from an organization where we look after each other, where you really are your brother's keeper. And there are so many people out here on the outside that really want to help you on the, on the outside as well. You know, I offer, you can reach out to me at any time. I'm on Instagram, right? The team guy. Okay. That was going to be my next question. Absolutely. How can people get in touch with you? Which- hey, man, reach out to me at the team guy on Instagram. I will absolutely help you out as best I can. I'll do whatever I can do. If you need any advice, I'll tell you my story. We can talk deep about it. But at the end of the day, man, believe in yourself. Give yourself an opportunity. The transition piece is tough. Take the advice, seek out people that are doing the things that you want to do and ask them, hey, how do you get there? And people are always willing to show you the process, right? And when it comes to job finding, listen, maybe you don't nail it on the first shot, but it's a process. You got to get out there. You got to write that resume. You got to learn how to put that together. If you're trying to start your own business, again, seek out people that are doing the things that you're doing. Understand finance and how to run an actual business. So that way you are successful, man. You give yourself the best opportunity possible. It's, it's great on the outside. I know it could be rough, but at the end of the day, man, you know, believe in yourself, respect yourself, apologize to your loved ones. If you've done anything that's crazy, forgive yourself too. You know, don't be so hard on yourself, man. Give yourself every opportunity you can to succeed and you will. I know you're busy. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you, Paul. This Thank you. Incredible, man. Thank you. I appreciate you watching, but before you go, if you like the video, please hit that subscribe button. Also, any comments are appreciated. Thank you.